Hello and welcome to your second video of the semester. Uh, today we're going to look at some information on the Ottoman Empire, the Habsburg Empire, and this expansion that's happening in Western Europe. Uh, this is only going to be a couple of slides long, but don't let that fool you. There's going to be a lot of information that I'm giving you, so um, you may want to you know, just kind of jot down some notes of what I'm saying here. Um, let's start first with this idea of Christian expansion. Uh, in what's known as the Iberian Peninsula, which is today Andorra, Spain, and Portugal, there had been kind of this truce between Muslim and Christian forces for, for probably 100 or 200 years or so. But in the 1200s, religious warfare is going to break out again. And this is going to become known as the Reconquista, or reconquering. Now, this warfare, it's really going to lead to the creation of modern-day Spain. But it's also going to lead to the conquering of a place called Granada. It's going to lead to Portugal beginning to explore the world, which then leads to Spain exploring the world, all in an attempt to bypass Islam and kind of not only reconquer territory, but reconquer power. Now, there are a couple different reasons why European exploration is going to happen. Uh, the first one, though, it's not because of population. Uh, very often when I ask people why European exploration happens, they say, oh, well, there were too many people and they had to go somewhere. The truth is the exact opposite. There was an event that is somewhat timely today because today, it was a pandemic. Uh, it was known as the Black Death or the Black Plague. Somewhere around 50% of all Europeans died. So there's plenty of space. So population is not a reason for exploration. So what were the reasons? Well, there's one reason that you can look at that involves strong national governments. If you look at the countries that explore, it's England, it's France, it's Spain, it's Portugal, even Sweden a little bit explored. And that's because they all had strong national governments. There's also this scarcity of items. You've probably heard of people looking for gold, people looking for silver, but there's also people looking for spices. Pepper, like black pepper that you put on probably everything, was one of the most sought after, one of the most expensive spices. Well, at this time, all those spice trades were either run by Muslim merchants or people who worked with Muslim merchants. And the strong national governments wanted a way around that so they could make their own money. There are also new inventions. The most important is this ship called a caravel, C-A-R-A-V-E-L. Think of the ship that Christopher Columbus came over to the Americas in, that big tall ship with the three sails on it. Uh, there's also an astrolabe so you can tell where you are on a map. There's better map making too. So there's all these new inventions that make it easier to travel. Now, Portugal is going to be the first to really explore. They, they find the Azor Islands, which are off the coast of Africa, in the 1200s. And eventually, there's going to be a person named Prince Henry who opens a school of navigation where he teaches sailors how to do map making, how to navigate using all these new inventions, how to use science to figure out where you are and where you're going. And before you know it, using all the stuff that's learned in Prince Henry's School of Navigation, the Portuguese are going to work their way down the coast of Africa. They're going to control the entire West Coast, which means they control the gold trade and the slave trade into and out of Europe. And Portugal really makes a lot of money and becomes a wealthy, important kingdom, at least for a little bit. Eventually, the Portuguese are going to go all the way to India. Uh, Vasco da Gama is going to become the first Portuguese 
person to sail around Africa. And he's going to reach India in the year 1498. Now, Vasco da Gama, he's not going to get a lot of product because he doesn't really understand how the trading works in India. But what he does get, he's able to make a 600% profit, even after paying all, for all the ships, all of his crew, and the entire cost of the voyage. In Spain, Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabella of Castile are going to get married in 1469, and they're going to create a united Spain. And when we get to 1492, this united Spain is looking for a way to make money. And they're going to hire Christopher Columbus and ask him to sail towards India. Now, Christopher Columbus has this idea that he can sail west and make it to India. And in September of 1492, he loads up a couple of ships. He sails west. In late October of 1492, he reaches land. He thinks he's off the coast of India, but he's not. He's actually in the Caribbean. He's actually in Bermuda, not Bermuda, but um, the Bahamas on an island that he calls San Salvador. Now, ironically, Christopher Columbus is one of the last explorers to really make it to the New World. He's not actually the first. So when we say Christopher Columbus discovered America, sorry to, you know, destroy this myth that Christopher Columbus didn't really discover anything. In fact, Christopher Columbus went to his deathbed thinking he was off the coast of India and never realized that he was off the coast of the Americas. Now we also have to talk about the Ottoman Empire in here. Uh, the Ottoman Empire was established in the early 1300s by a guy who uh, was named Osman I. He was a Turkish warlord and he was the ruler of the Oz of the Osman clan, if you will, from 1281 to 1324. Now the Osman clan is going to become known as the Ottoman clan. That's where it gets its name. It's also known as a gunpowder kingdom because it was the first empire to get gunpowder from China and they didn't really share it with anybody. So they use gunpowder to expand in between 1290 and 1325. Osman goes from just controlling a little piece of land to having an entire culturally diverse empire. Now this empire is going to be managed through a military unit known as a Janissary. Uh, the earliest evidence of Janissaries is 1383, I think it is. And they're going to last all the way up until 1826. So this idea of a Janissary lasts a long time. Now, what a Janissary was, it was a young Christian boy, uh, usually between the ages of 6 and 12, who are forcibly taken from Christian territories that are controlled by the Ottomans. These boys are sent into Turkish families where they learn to speak the Turkish language. They learn Turkish culture. They're forced to convert to Islam, uh, they can't have beards, and they're basically career soldiers and career administrators. They're paid for by the emperor known as a sultan. In 1453, the Ottomans, led by Sultan Mehmet II, is going to attack Constantinople. And the this is very well documented on April 6th of 1453, Mehmet attacks Constantinople, and on May 29th of 1453, Constantinople is defeated. Now this is important because it ends the Byzantine Empire. And the Byzantine Empire, if you haven't had World History I, was the last remaining link to the old Roman Empire. Another really interesting thing about the Ottoman Empire is the Topkapi Palace. 
Uh, this was a very large palace. You can go visit it today if you go to the city of Istanbul. And the emperors of the Ottoman Empire, especially Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, are going to establish the palace as the location where all the power is stored, if you will. Uh, at its largest, the Topiki uh, Palace had 10, ma 10 mosques, a treasury, the library, all the court officials, the Sultan's personal reference. Um, there were 14 bathhouses, two hospitals, 2,000 2, women lived there, many of whom were consorts or special friends, if you will, of the Sultan's. And there were over 4,000 horses. So the palace becomes the symbol of power in the Ottoman Empire. And if that's not cool enough, the Ottoman Empire fought Dracula. You probably never realize this, but Dracula was a real person. Not the way he's depicted in like Bram Stoker's Dracula or anything like that, but Dracula was a real person. His name was Vlad the Third Tepes, and he was from a place called Wallachia. Now, if you look at a map today, Wallachia doesn't actually exist anymore, but what you will find is a place called Romania. Now, why is he called Dracula? Because he was known as Vlad the Impaler, or Vlad Tepe's Dracula, and his dad was Vlad Dracul. Now, the story goes that Vlad's dad, Vlad II, made a deal with the Ottomans to regain his throne after he was tossed out by some nobles. Vlad II is assassinated, and the Ottomans put Vlad III on the throne and think they can control him. Well, when Vlad III doesn't do what he's supposed to do, he makes the Ottomans mad. Vlad III destroys whole victims or whole villages trying to get rid of the Ottomans and the estimates are there's somewhere between 40 and 100,000 victims that he killed. Now there, it goes even crazier than this. In 1462 Wallachia or Romania is invaded by the Ottomans trying to capture Vlad Tepes or Vlad Dracul and to stop the Ottomans from attacking, Vlad took 20,000 people, impaled them on giant spikes, put these spikes on the side of the road, and dared the Ottomans to come get him. Now, Vlad Dracula is seen as a hero in modern-day Romania, but he's also the origin of the vampire myth. So the Ottomans are pretty cool stuff. Two other empires that are related to the Ottomans are the Safavid Empire and the Mughal Empire. Now the Safavid Empire is established in the late 1400s by the Persians in what would be today modern day Iraq and modern day Iran. And they're a Muslim kingdom just like the Ottomans, but they're not friends with the Ottomans. In fact, the Ottomans and the Safavids fight, and the Safavids and a group I'm going to talk about in a minute, the Habsburgs, kind of join up to beat up on the Ottomans. However, the Ottomans are too strong, and the Safavids are going to be the ones who, who kind of get the short end of the stick. Now, the Safavid Empire was run by Shiite Muslims, even though the majority of its people were Sunni Muslims. Now, the biggest difference is just how they believe. Uh, think of it kind of like in Christianity, there's Catholics and there's Protestants. And in Islam, there's Shiites and there's Sunnis. Uh, one group believe that Muhammad, you can only look at what he wrote down in the Quran. The other group believe with Muhammad, you have to look not only at what he wrote down, but how he acted. And depending on if you were, you're a by-the-book person or if you are a by-the-book and actions person, depends on which side of the Shiite-Sunni line you fall on. 
But the Shiites, even though they were the minority, they had control of the empire. And the Sunnis, who made up a little bit more than half of the population, were heavily persecuted. Now, this instability between the Shiites and the Sunnis can still be seen today. Uh, you can think of ISIS, you can think of the Taliban. All of that goes back to this time period in the 1400s. Now, the most famous of the Safavid rulers, his name was Shah Abbas. Uh, he ruled from 1588 to 1629, and he required everybody to practice Shiite Islam. Uh, he was also crazy. Um, he was very paranoid. Uh, he had nearly every member of his family blinded or killed if he didn't trust them. This included one of his own sons. So he was so crazy. He was. He thought people was out. He thought people were out to get him, and he would even harm or kill his own family members. Now, in the late 1500s, the Safavids tried to become friends with the Habsburg dynasty that I'm going to talk about in a minute. It doesn't work out so well because the Ottomans were stronger and the Ottomans are going to partially conquer the Safavid Empire. Um, modern day Iran used to be known as Persia and before that it was the only remaining part of the Safavid Empire. Modern day Iraq was conquered by the Ottomans and became part of the Ottoman Empire. Now the Mughal Empire, uh, Mughal is a Hindu word from Mongol, if you're curious. Uh, the Mughals were Muslim leaders who took over Hindu kingdoms in northern India. And these Mughal emperors were very wealthy because they controlled all of the trade routes. They were in charge of the Silk Road, if you've heard of that. And they were the ones in charge of all the different supplies as well. Now there are many different rulers that are worth knowing for the for the Mughal Empire. I'm only going to give you a couple of them though. Um, there's one named Baber, B-A-B-U-R. Baber is considered the first Mughal. Uh, he conquers India starting in 1523 and by 1530 he controls the entire northern part of India. Uh, he's got a son whose name is Humayun. Uh, don't worry about the spelling. You can look it up if you want to, but his name is Humayun. Humayun is very interested in science and astrology. He builds this giant library, but in 1556, he falls down the stairs of his library and dies. And eventually, we get all the way down to a gentleman named Aurangzeb in 1658. Aurangzeb takes over from his father, through battle, basically civil warfare. Aurangzeb is kind of crazy too. I mean, I guess everybody has her crazy. But Aurangzeb, he's this hardcore, dedicated Muslim. Uh, he forces everybody to convert to Islam. He prohibits Hinduism. He destroys Hindu temples. And he makes it a law that you must marry if you're female. And if you don't marry, then you were put to death. Uh, by the time Aurangzeb dies, pretty much everybody hates him. And the British are going to come in and take control of India, mostly because Aurangzeb makes it easy to do. Now the Habsburgs, they're very important in European history. Uh, originally the Habsburgs were a powerful family of nobles. And they're going to marry into royal families. They're going to eventually become royalty themselves. And they're going to be the, the rulers of Spain, of Portugal, parts of Italy before Italy unites, uh, parts of Germany before Germany unites, Austria, the Netherlands, parts of Belgium, uh, parts of Hungary. Uh, they're even going to come to rule Romania, parts of Greece, etc., etc. Now, in 1550, 
five, I think it is, Charles V is going to separate his empire into two parts because it's so big. And his son, Philip II, is going to get the western part. He's going to get control over Spain. He's going to get control over Naples and a couple other Italian areas. Philip II is going to get control of the Netherlands. And he's also going to get, going to get control of all of the Spanish territory in the New World. And this is going to become known as Spanish Habsburg. His brother Ferdinand gets control of Austria, Bohemia, which was part of Germany today, um, and part of the Czech Republic today. Uh, going to get control of Hungary and the Holy Roman Empire, which was mostly a, a conglomerate or a group of small German kingdoms. Now, Charles, his hope was that Ferdinand and Philip would help each other, but they kind of don't. They have different ideas. Um, Ferdinand is going to go one way. Philip's going to go the other. Uh, Philip's going to restart the Inquisition, basically this hardcore challenging of are you are you Catholic? And if you're not, then, you know, we'll put you on the rack or kill you or whatever it might be if you don't confess. Uh, Philip II is going to forcibly convert Muslims to Christianity. And a lot of this was due to his fear of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, since Spain was once Muslim held, there were still a lot of Muslim people in Spain. And he basically said, you're either with us or against us. You either convert to Christianity or you're out. Uh, Ferdinand, because he's closer to the Ottoman Empire, he's going to go to war directly with the Ottomans. So there's going to be fighting in Hungary. There's going to be fighting in um, Greece. There's going to be fighting in modern day uh, Romania, modern day Bulgaria, and the fighting is more direct there between Ferdinand and the Ottomans. Now, eventually, uh, Ferdinand, his part of the empire is going to arguably be more successful, but in the end, the Habsburgs, they waste a lot of money. That's one way to put it. They waste a lot of money. And if it's not bad enough, you know, the Western, or not the Western, but the Eastern Habsburgs, the Ferdinand branch, uh, they're going to lose a lot of power because of a new kingdom called Prussia that is created in the 1600s. Ultimately, though, the Habsburg Empire in some way, shape, or form is going to exist all the way up until 1918 after the end of World War One. So they are still they are successful and there are still Habsburgs today that have some prince roles and some princess roles. But uh, the Habsburgs are going to use the money from the American empires. They're going to use all the silver and all the gold from North and South America to fund the building of these strong central governments. So Spain becomes a strong kingdom. Portugal becomes a strong kingdom. The Austrian-Hungarian Empire becomes a strong kingdom. And that money is also going to be used to go to war directly against Islam and directly against the Ottomans. So, like I said, only a couple of slides, but a lot of information there. Um, I personally am very interested in the Habsburgs just because there's so much history there. Uh, if you get interested, you should look up uh, information about the Habsburg chin. There's a birth defect that is dedicated to the Habsburgs that give them this extraordinarily pronounced chin. And it's still a birth defect that you can find in some parts of Europe today. Thanks. For this week, between now and the 25th at 11.59 p.m. You need to find time to do your first discussion question and your chapter 16 quiz. There is one primary source document today. It's called the Turkish Letters. And there it's about a visit to the Ottoman Empire that this European dignitary has 
and it has a, a lot of information in it about the Janissaries and the differences between where he's from and what he discovers in the Ottoman Empire. All right, as always, any questions, any comments, any concerns, anything like that, just give me an email and I'll answer as quickly as I can. I hope you find this video interesting and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.